We have two, two great speakers today, uh, two infectious disease leaders. Uh, first up, we have uh, Dr. Mark Anderson, who is an infectious disease physician from Chattanooga. He did his medical school at Tulane. Uh, and then he did his uh, training at the Naval Hospital in San Diego, internal medicine, his fellowship in ID, uh, and had various experiences uh, in, in different settings in the Naval Medical Center in Oakland in California. But currently he's the chairman of the ethics committee at Memorial Healthcare System, as well as the director of infection control and serves on the pharmacy and therapeutic committee there. So we're really grateful for him to be here today and talk to us. After Dr. Anderson, we have Dr. Mark, uh, Dr. Robert Atmar, who is also an infectious disease physician from Houston, Texas. Uh, Dr. Atmar did his medical school, his residency, his fellowship at Baylor, and he currently is the chief of infectious disease there and has his research and clinical care at, uh, down, at, uh, down at Baylor. So we're really happy to have both of them. Uh, really, we're focusing on vaccines today. And I think, you know, we're, we're at a position, and I think we're going to hear Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Atmar talk about this a little bit, where we're going to end up having no long lines at our door, but we're going to be the ones reaching out and, and convincing people to get vaccinated. And, th and that's going to be part of our job going forward as, as physicians and, and APPs in our system. And, and as I think about it, I just want to thank everybody for the hard work that, that, that has been happening across the uh, common spirit uh, physician enterprise with, you know, hundreds of thousands of vaccinated patients, uh, many more to come, but great work for everybody. And I can't thank everybody enough. So Dr. Anderson, why don't you start off? So uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, for that introduction, Dr. McGinn. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our experience here in Chattanooga, Hamilton County. Um, this is, the vaccinations have been conducted mainly outside of the ones that in the beginning that we did for healthcare personnel and for nursing homes, the, uh, our, our local health department conducted those vaccinations. We have a great health department here uh, that I've had the privilege of, of working closely with in my 26 years in Chattanooga. And they've done a great job. We're at, uh, we have about 22% of our population in the county who have received the first vaccine uh, dose uh, and a little, little more than uh, half of that are fully vaccinated. They have done this through uh, computer appointments, and that did cause some problems for people who don't have access or, or have the ability to do that. So one of the things we did here uh, at, at CHI Memorial was to attempt to, to help out with that process. Uh, for uh, one reason, we're actually in the middle of the city. We're right in the middle of uh, many underserved uh, neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods, and so, we volunteered to help out with that vaccination effort and either go and do it on site somewhere or here at the hospital uh, for people that were close by. We utilized uh, some of our local African-American churches to help us uh, find the patients. We still were doing people over a certain age or with, uh, with medical conditions, it wasn't a general vaccination, but uh, with that, we're able to give uh, right now, we've given 2,200 doses uh, in this area to this underserved population, uh, and uh, we're going to actually complete the second dose uh, phase of this uh, this weekend. Um, we've also uh, helped out in North Georgia. We're right on the border of Georgia, and we've given over 4,000 first doses to rural areas uh, just across the state line uh, from us. Uh, also, some underserved areas or people who couldn't who wouldn't be able to arrange this through the usual channels. Um, so I wanna, I wanna move on though and, and talk about uh, uh, vaccine uh, reluctance. That's not been a big issue so far because uh, we've had limited vaccine. Uh, we, we, we're, we've experienced more sort of vaccine hunger. Uh, my wife is a, is a pediatrician in rural North Georgia uh, and one person who was desperate came in and said they had heard that there was a bovine coronavirus uh, vaccine that they thought they could get through the, the seed and feed store nearby. So uh, I usually don't have snappy comebacks, but I, I told her that she needed to tell them that's the, for the cow coronavirus, not the coronavirus. But, uh, but I, I think right now there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest uh, and maybe even the scarcity of it is inducing people to want the vaccine more. Those of you who have raised children will We'll understand that, but but we're getting a lot more vaccine. Uh, our supply is increasing here. 
in uh, Hamilton County, we have begun to get vaccine actually here at Memorial to give in our primary care clinics. We're really excited about that because th that's how many people get their vaccines. Uh, and I think that's gonna increase our uptake. But that, um, and, uh, but, but I, we still worry about the, the vaccine reluctance. Uh, we've, there, there was one study done by Michigan State that uh, showed only 51% of Americans in their survey were ready to get the vaccine. This is before the campaign started as compared to 71% in Great Britain. So that, that's very concerning. We've had we've had we've had debate. Uh, we've we've had uh, things to mitigate this pandemic become a political issue rather than a scientific issue in this country, and so that's going to carry over into our vaccine campaign and and worsen this vaccine reluctance. Um, and so you could you would ask uh, as a as a physician as a as a physician's assistant nurse practitioner. So what can you do as an individual? Well, I think you can do a, a huge amount. I think that, that sometimes we, it feels like our patients don't really listen to us, uh, particularly staying adherent to their medications, but, but they do. They do, for the most part, trust us a great deal. Uh, and uh, one of the affirmations of that was seen in, in HIV medication, uh, which I, I've taken care of a lot of HIV patients my 30 years in infectious disease and in studies of adherence, which is just so crucial with, with, for the success of HIV therapy, they found any number of things had no effect or really didn't pan out as with adherence, age, sex, national or, origin, uh, rural, urban, uh, education level. The most important positive factor for good adherence was how much they trusted the person taking care of them their physician, or in many cases, a nurse practitioner. And that's those, when that existed, they had great adherence, they had an undetectable viral load. Um, there, have, there have been some uh, 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 reports of, of local studies in Great Britain. Uh, there was, this is, uh, this is uh, reported in the news media, not in a peer reviewed article, but they found uh, that uh, GPs uh, who made uh, direct one-on-one -on -one phone calls with people who were vaccine reluctant. Uh, after that, uh, there was a uh, about a 69% instance of people then scheduling make, uh, an appointment for a vaccine. So one-to-one -one conversations from us with our patients do make a difference. So I'm asking each of you, it doesn't matter what your specialty is, but you need to talk about this uh, vaccine for COVID-19 in every single patient interaction that you have all day long, every day. I would say that this is one of the most important things of your medical career. Again, no matter what your specialty is. Uh, we have a, a, a committee that advises our county mayor here and one of the strongest physician members of that committee is an orthopedic surgeon. He does this all day long. He discusses the vaccine and he's educated himself very, very well about it and he's having an impact on, on his patients. So I would ask you to do that. Um, be aware of, of, the, of uh, your political leaders, obviously a touchy area, but if they're not on board with vaccination, you need to talk to them. If they are, support them in every way, appear publicly with them uh, so that they, people see that when they're at, when he or she asks them to get the vaccine, they, uh, it's in, in it has your support behind them. Um, that is, I think, a, a crucial thing. So I will stop there because uh, I know we, we want to hear more details about uh, the vaccine itself uh, from uh, Dr. Atmar. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. That was perfect uh, summary. And uh, now we'll have Dr. Atmar uh, give us an update on, on the vaccine. And, and, uh, and then after that, we'll have a, a short panel discussion. We have Dr. Weeb with us here today, and obviously Dr. Green's wife. We'll have a conversation after Dr. Atmar is done. Robert? Thank you, and I appreciate the invitation to speak to you today. Next slide. Um, because this is CME, I need to give you some disclosures. Uh, I participate in a lot of the uh, vaccine trials, um, either directly by enrolling patients or in supervisory roles uh, for the COVID-19. Our site has also uh, been active in some of the studies carried on by ACT that led to uh, the approval of remdesivir. 
and then before COVID-19 and still to a certain uh, uh, bit now, um, my one of my areas of expertise is norovirus. So I've gotten research support from Takeda vaccines. Next slide. So uh, I'm gonna start with a case um, that uh, this is a 47 year old a physician who received the Pfizer vaccine in mid-December, shortly after it received emergency use authorization and was available in our hospital. The following morning, he noted uh, a macular papular, not popular rash that was extremely pruritic. Um, and you can see the, the rash, uh, hopefully on your computer, um, a typical drug type uh, rash. The symptoms were somewhat alleviated by antihistamines and topical steroids, but it lasted several days. So the question he asked us is what should be done about his second dose of um, Pfizer vaccine? He's a critical care physician. And so it was very important to him to get protected. Next slide. Um, so, you know, this reaction is likely allergic in nature. Um, and uh, temporarily, it was not uh, an immediate uh, type reaction. So probably not IgE mediate, mediated. Um, and he had no other uh, precipitating causes uh, identified. I mean, it's always possible that he had an intercurrent uh, 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 viral illness, but that's highly unlikely with the nature of the rash and the, and the timing. Um, we discussed it with him and at that time uh, decided because it was allergic in nature and even though it wasn't classified as a severe reaction, um, to have him defer the second dose of uh, vaccine in anticipation that uh, uh, other vaccines would be coming uh, along. And sure enough, the Janssen J&J &J Adeno 26 vaccine has received uh, emergency use authorization and he plans to um, take this vaccine when it's uh, available. We've had a few doses, uh, but where he's able to get vaccinated, is not yet uh, available. I checked with him end of last week and he hadn't yet gotten vaccinated, but that's, that was the plan and that was the advice. Um, it's, it's thought that uh, the reactions that people are having to these mRNA vaccines that are allergic in nation, uh, nature may, well be related to the polyethylene glycol, PEG, in the vaccines, and those should not be uh, in the Janssen vaccine. Next slide. So these are the three uh, uh, vaccines that are, are currently available through EUA. The Pfizer and Moderna are both uh, mRNA-based. Um, they're uh, lipid nanoparticles. The Pfizer uses a European approach of two doses three weeks apart, and the Moderna uh, is more of the US approach where the two doses are given four weeks apart. And both of those um, have been associated with uh, anaphylaxis in the uh, post uh, marketing surveillance that has been done. Um, Pfizer is about twice as likely, um, although uh, the, the confidence intervals around that are somewhat larger. And then um, it also appears that these reactions are more likely to occur in people who've had previous IgE mediated anaphylactis or anaphylactoid reactions in the past. Um, Janssen uh, is a different uh, approach. It's a replication deficient uh, adenovirus vector. It's uh, currently authorized as a single dose. Although there are studies, uh, phase three efficacy, there is a phase three efficacy study being conducted uh, with a two dose regimen. Uh, to see if they can improve somewhat on the uh, efficacy that we'll discuss in a, in a moment. Um, certainly the immunogenicity in the phase one and two trials with the two-dose regimen uh, leads to higher antibody levels uh, with the two-dose regimen compared to the one-dose regimen. Um, we really don't know about anaphylaxis. There's not been a large amount of that uh, rolled out yet. I think they have had one case uh, recognized um, in the clinical trials. Next slide. So um, the CDC, uh, when they considered the Janssen vaccine the day after uh, it, they made a recommendation for, it. in general, they came up with this clinical consideration 
that people with a contraindication to one of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, including uh, a known PEG allergy, uh, consideration could be given to vaccinate with the Janssen vaccine. And people who received one mRNA COVID-19 vaccine dose, but for whom a second dose is contraindicated, uh, they could receive uh, uh, the Janssen vaccine to really complete their um, uh, immunization, primary immunization. And that's what we uh, recommended for our, our case patient. It's supported by the CDC recommendations. Next slide. Now, um, are all of the EUA vaccines alike? And this is a table I put together um, after Bob Weeb had sent me a somewhat smaller table uh, trying to summarize, you know, comparing the different vaccines. And um, I, I wanna walk you through it a, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the three vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen, or J&J &J, are listed. Um, the data source is uh, the next column. And you know, the important considerations that have led to recommendations that patients, persons receive whichever vaccine they can get are really the next three columns. Death, hospitalization, and prevention of se severe disease are all very similar for, for these uh, um, vaccines. Some of these outcomes weren't even reported in the phase three clinical trials. They didn't have enough patients. Um, and even for the uh, J&J, &J, the estimates are based on relatively small numbers of patients. So the confidence intervals are very large. Next slide. So if you look at symptomatic infection though, this is where the mRNA vaccines distinguish themselves from the J&J &J vaccines. And these are really using comparable definitions. So the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines both have over 90%, almost 95% uh, protection against symptomatic infection, um, including patients who are not sick enough to go to the hospital or be admitted. Whereas the Janssen is closer to 67% uh, across all sites. In the US, it was 72%. Is this important? Well, there are data that are coming out that people who have symptomatic uh, COVID-19 in the outpatient uh, setting can develop long COVID uh, uh, symptoms. And there was a, a paper recently published in JAMA Network that uh, out of the University of Washington, where a third of the patients who had outpatient COVID-19 or had COVID-19, all comers, including outpatient, uh, still had one or more symptoms six months later. So this becomes uh, a quality, and about 30% reported a decrease in quality of life. Um, and so given a choice, you know, if you ask me which one I want, I want the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine compared to the J&J. &J. And as clinicians, we want what's best for our patients. And so this becomes a bit of an important conversation. Next slide. Um, the other thing to note, and this is, there's an error on this slide from Moderna. I say approximately six, six, 72%. It's actually closer to 62%. But all of these studies in various forms are beginning to show that vaccination can prevent asymptomatic infection, which suggests that, you know, if you can't get infected, you're unlikely to uh, spread um, the virus. And I think that's, you know, uh, the reason the CDC is now beginning to loosen some of the recommendations for uh, uh, the use of uh, masks and, and small uh, group settings outside of uh, the work setting. Um, and we may see more of that in the coming weeks. Next slide. So uh, this is uh, that uh, a table from that paper I mentioned um, from the University of Washington. And it's really the... Uh, the middle column without patients where 65% had no symptoms at uh, uh, six months. And you can see the distribution um, below that for uh, one, two, or more, three or more symptoms um, and the worsened quality of life. Next slide. And next slide. And uh, so this is the other piece of data that was in the uh, uh, FDA 
briefing document um, showing that persons who uh, were, were 60 years of age and older and had an other comorbidity, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, the estimated uh, vaccine efficacy at uh, with onset after 28 days was under 50%. It was only 42%. So in my older patients who have a comorbid condition, uh, the estimates for the mRNA vaccines were all over 80 and many of them over 90%. Um, this is another distinguishing area where uh, a mRNA vaccine is probably better. Next slide. Um, so, you know, where could the Janssen vaccine be given? It can be given in unique clinics, newly established vaccine clinics or sites uh, that don't have freezer capacity necessary for the mRNA vaccines. Um, it could also be given to people who don't wanna come back for a second shot or are less likely to come back for a second shot um, or uh, mobile or even homebound populations. This is based on ACIP uh, recommendations. Next slide. And for you know, patients that come to your clinic, and if your clinic uh, uh, or clinical setting has both uh, an mRNA and the J&J &J vaccine available, this is a way to uh, begin to put the uh, two different uh, vaccine types in, in perspective. And in the orangish part, um, the mRNA vaccine, uh, are associated with a higher frequency of reactogenicity. Most people will have reactions, whereas it's uh, relatively less frequent with the J&J &J vaccine. We've talked about the symptomatic uh, uh, COVID-19 effectiveness or efficacy, and full protection uh, takes a little bit longer to achieve with the mRNA vaccines compared to the J&J &J vaccine. Um, but they all are highly protective against severe uh, outcomes, including hospitalization, ICU care, and death. Next slide. Um, just to mention that uh, about the, the variants, there are three that are of particular interest. Um, the UK variant, also called the B117, the South Africa variant, B1351, uh, and then the Brazil variant, uh, P1. These are characterized by certain nucleic acid changes in the, um, in the virus genome. And really, uh, with the exception of the UK variant, where there's a PCR assay that can be done to distinguish it from uh, uh, the Wuhan, which was what circulated through most of the US at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you have to do uh, whole genome sequencing or sequencing at least of most of the spike gene to be able to identify these variants. Here in Houston, um, we've seen all three of these variants with the UK variant becoming much more uh, common. And across the US, it seems like it's uh, taking over. The good news is that all of the three vaccines we have seem to protect against uh, the UK variant. And at least based on serologic studies, there's an expectation that uh, we'll see protection um, uh, against and fully vaccinated persons against the South Africa and Brazil variant, but we're waiting on more data to confirm that. Next slide. Um, and these are just the data showing um, the, if you use either the Wuhan variant um, uh, and then compare the different mutations in, in the A panel, that's the UK variant. And if even with all the mutations, the uh, titers, of it, neutralization are the same compared to the wild type strain. Um, and that's true with human serum. Uh, um, and then for the South African variant or the next two panels, and you can see that the titers are somewhat lower, but still neutralizations uh, achieved um, uh, after vaccination. Next slide. So these are some of the outstanding questions that remain. How long are the vaccines gonna uh, protect? Um, we don't know that yet. We know from the Moderna uh, trial that at three months after completion of vaccination, there's still high titers of neutralizing antibody present. Um, there are studies that are ongoing looking at uh, booster either with the Wuhan variant 
or with a novel variant. Um, and we'll be collecting uh, vaccine effectiveness data to look at the effect of variants on protection. And there are trials now that have begun to look at vaccines in children and to establish their safety, what doses should be given. Um, and hopefully we'll have the ability to vaccinate our children sometime later this year. And I think with that, I think that was my last slide. Uh, we'll take questions or begin the discussion part. Thank you so much. That was a, a great review. So, um, well, why don't I maybe, and Dr. Anderson, and we have Dr. Weeb with us here, our chief medical officer, and Gary is here. Um, so we can maybe, I mean, one of the challenges, you know, Rob, when you, when we start nuancing between the different vaccines is the messaging to our patients and our colleagues gets complicated. And sometimes when messaging gets complicated, you know, we don't achieve our goals uh, of getting towards, a, you know, a herd immunity. And, and, and so, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always like going through this mental exercise of, yeah, you're right, but if we complicate this message so much, you know, we may actually turn people away. Um, it's so much easier to just say, you know, that, you know, the saying at the very beginning was the best vaccine is the vaccine you can get. And um, any thoughts about that in terms of, you know, the, the kind of downside of the, the complexity of the story? Is that, am I making sense? And Mark, feel free to jump in here because I know well, I, you know, I, I, all, sorry, go ahead. I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, you know, the national messaging has been just what you've, you've said. Um, and, and yet, you know, as, someone who's uh, studied vaccines for decades and uh, was on the ACIP until uh, yeah. the end of December, you know, I, and, and as a clinician, I, I, you know, we have information in front of us. I feel that it's important for us to take the information that we have and try and synthesize it as best we can for our patients. I don't know that I would necessarily have this discussion with uh, um, every patient, particularly as we move into young, healthy uh, individuals. Um, and what we have tried to do in our healthcare system, and I haven't yet seen it, seen it, but you know that table I showed that you know kind of showed it where the contrasts were, you know the benefits of one versus the other, uh, and we're trying to even simplify that further our communications people are mm -hmm. to be able to you know to message that and and people who are really or who educate themselves on the internet uh, and, and want to get one of the other vaccines if you can set them up in different clinics and allow people and allow you know even the waiting lines to get in to get vaccinated uh, manage some of that. Um, you know, I think that's probably okay. I'm particularly bothered by having a, uh, two parents over the age of uh, uh, 80, one of whom has uh, significant comorbid conditions. I really would not want uh, I would really prefer an mRNA vaccine for mm -hmm. her and for my patients who have that. I, you know, to, a, and so it's going to be a little bit longer discussion. And if one can develop the graphics to have that discussion with the patient, I know patients who would just as soon get one dose and be done. Right. And, right, and, right. and so uh, it, it is a challenge for us as clinicians and, yeah, it, you know, we can take it, take that information and, and interpret it and, decide to present it to our patients in whatever form um, we choose to do. Let me ask Mark if you have any. Mark, you're, you, you opened up by talking about the fact that you've been working in both kind of urban underserved communities and rural underserved communities and, and the issue of one shot, follow-up shot and communication. Um, have you, you have any thoughts you know, about this? Or uh, I mean, I, I agree with the concerns about the most vulnerable people perhaps getting uh, the, uh, the mRNA vaccines. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I think it was good that 
in this early period, those were the vaccines that were available to us when we were when we mm. needed to give it to the most vulnerable people. That actually, right, right, if kind of worked out nice. Yeah, if we had planned that, I mean, that's the way yeah. we would have wanted to do it. Uh, but and I so, know when Robert uh, was on the panel, he planned it that way, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, I, as my understanding, there's going to be a uh, there should be a much larger supply of the. Uh, of the Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine, if with Merck uh, agreeing to make that vaccine, and and I think when that becomes available, we probably will be in a state where we're giving it to younger, healthier people. But I, I think when we reach a state where there's a good vaccine supply and uh, such that we can give it in our offices, then I think we can we can make those decisions. We can uh, uh, mm -hmm, point mm -hmm. a patient uh, one way or the other on an individual basis without having to make any sort of public announcement of saying, ah, oh, you guys need to do this vaccine because again, we don't want to, we don't want to feed the vaccine uh, reluctance uh, at all. So. Yeah. Hey, uh, Dr. Weave, you know, you've been working with communications, so giving that graph and simplifying things and um, you feel like we have it down to a good message to it's more educating the physicians, I think, who then can talk to the, or the APPs who then talk to their, 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 their patients, I suppose. Yeah, I think we're getting that message out, Tom. And I think as, um, as we get more supply of all the various vaccines, then I think we're in a position for, as Dr. Atmar would say, is, you know, the shared decision-making uh, discussion with the individual mm -hmm. patient. Um, but I think when we message large populations, I think simple is probably better. Um, the issue will be um, where maybe the mRNA vaccine is not available today, but the Janssen vaccine is. And maybe given what's going on in the community at the time, how comfortable are people waiting? Because of course there is a risk while you're waiting for the mRNA vaccine that you could potentially uh, come down with uh, COVID-19. So. The question is, at what point, is it a week, is it a month, is it three months, you know, how long are you willing to wait um, for the mRNA vaccine and how much risk are you willing to accept? So those are, are difficult discussions. The, the science isn't perfect. Um, and again, you know, it will vary by community by how much spread is occurring at the given time. One, yeah. one of the, can, can I just- Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Robert. One of the, uh, there was a survey that was presented at the last ACIP meeting asking that question. If, if uh, adults in the US um, uh, had a choice of waiting a month uh, for a more effective vaccine compared to a less effective vaccine, about just over 40% of adults would wait that month. So yeah. there are you know, some people who would prefer to go with a, highly effective vaccine compared to moderately effective vaccine. The flip side of that though is as we try to gain on the virus and get herd immunity to prevent spread to reduce the variants that occur, right? So you 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 could sit here and say, yeah, let's everybody choose and wait, but then suddenly you're still sitting at 40% vaccination of the community and suddenly new variants pop up and you lose the race. So there's a broader public health mandate that we vaccinate quickly, rapidly, or we're going to find ourselves, you know, with five new variants. And so there, you know, there is that tension here that, you know, the, that there's the community drive to get the community at a, at a herd, you know, rate versus, yeah, the individual choice, take your time, don't worry about it. I think, you know, we have to, and I'm gonna let Gary talk a little bit, because I think right now we're hitting, and you're on mute, Gary, um, we're hitting this point where Gary is working with all the common spirit. I mean, we have what, 1200 clinic sites across the country and we have an amazing footprint. And we have all our APPs and our physicians that need to be engaged in the shared decision-making. Um, and, um, and the vaccines are slowly getting out to them. Gary, any input on that? Well, just uh, one thing I would say is, uh, at least my personal theory, and. Uh, I, I maybe even mentioned this on another call with Dr. Amar and Dr. Weeb is I, I believe that J&J &J will probably go with a either a second dose or a booster um, uh, in the near future. Now, I haven't seen the data, nor has anyone else, but it, it just logically makes sense that that will happen. And that may change the dynamics a lot. But I, I think 
the conversation that Mark had and Dr. Atmore are about one-on-one -on -one with, with your patients in the clinic, I think are important. Um, there's a couple of and there are questions in the chat room that I want to see if we can cover. Uh, and one of them um, uh, actually is two parts. Uh, and the longer part of the question is, is based on the vaccine uh, adverse event, event reporting system, as of right now, there are over 38,000 adverse events reported uh, attributed to COVID-19 vaccines. There are also 1,609 deaths reported. Uh, classically, the vaccine adverse um, event reporting system uh, reflects 10% of the actual complications. Uh, what would we as panelists say about that? We really haven't talked about that very much. And uh, I mean, um, uh, we've had 500,000 plus deaths from COVID. Uh, I don't know if all 1,609 of these deaths were related to vaccines, of course, but any comments from our panelists about that? Um, what, what would we say about that? So, um you know, these data are presented to uh, the ACIP uh, periodically. And, and again, uh, data from the VAR system was reported on March 1st. And they're, they have a long experience of getting reports. And they're really, and, and not only through VAERS, but they have several other uh, reporting systems um, set up and none of the events that have been described really rose above uh, thresholds uh, that gave a signal uh, that there's a concern with the vaccine. With uh, Pfizer vaccine, actually there was a report you know, early on in one of the Northern European countries where there you know, were a, a cluster of deaths that had uh, occurred and essentially they were vaccinating uh, uh, patients on their deathbed and not surprisingly, they died. Um, there have been deaths in the US uh, in nursing homes, but the rates of deaths and they've been doing uh, at the insistence of some of the ACIP members, including me when I was on there, uh, close surveillance of the nursing homes because the vaccines weren't studied in nursing home patients. And, and the death rates in nursing homes have not been any greater than they were you know, pre-vaccination or pre-COVID. So uh, it'll, as I tell people, life happens, life events happen, and they're going to continue to happen whether people are vaccinated or not. Um, and there have not been more life events than is expected. We've kind of lived through that with AstraZeneca and thromboembolic yeah. disease in the last week in Europe. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it is one of the great problems when you do something to millions of people and then things happen, people assume a causal relationship. And uh, I mean, what I, when I'm talking to yeah. patients, sorry, go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry, the, when I'm talking to patients about this, I often will literally hold up a calendar. Uh, and in the past, uh, people have asked about uh, Guillain Barre with influenza, but I'll hold up a calendar and, and talk about how we see Guillain Barre. I said, you know, every month, Guillain Bre is just happening at a steady rate, and we arrived October, November, and it keeps happening. And inevitably, coincidentally, uh, people are going to have that and and other things at the same time. And and so I said we rely on. I tell them we rely on the experts to look at this closely and see is it more frequent during this period of time that we're giving the vaccines. And if it's not, we feel comfortable it's not a direct cause. We really have to we have to discern that, or else we're we're back to our forebears who relate uh, something bad happening when the stars were in a certain configuration, and and we attribute it to that. Uh, so we're we, you know we should be better than that now, and and that that often helps them understand understand that's when they hear about a a single event happening to someone they know during the vaccine season. Good example. There was a um, and I think that. The guidelines are clear, but there was a question that someone could speak to um, that uh, the recommendation to vaccinate after someone has had COVID-19. Mark, you want to take that or? Well, well, I, well it's a general, uh, still a general recommendation that we do vaccinate after um, someone has had COVID 
probably, uh, I would say, at least 30 days or so um, from the, uh, from, or, or certainly when all the several weeks after their symptoms have resolved, we, there is, we still don't know long term what the uh, immunity from a, from a national infection is going to be. And we, at, when we have vaccine, particularly in vulnerable people, we don't want to take the chance uh, that that might be shorter lived than we than, than we hope. So that, that's my understanding as to why we're still recommending we give uh, that we still vaccinate those who have had diagnosed COVID. Yeah, the the antibody level after uh, uh, particularly a, a outpatient episode of COVID is tends to be on average lower than what's achieved right. with uh, vaccination. And reinfection in the first 90 days is less common, or at least was when it was a Wuhan uh, strain circulating. We really don't know with these um, uh, variant strains, but you get higher antibody titers. And while we don't have a correlative immunity yet, um, it is thought that uh, the higher antibody levels will lead to better protection, not just against the Wuhan strain, but against some of these uh, variants. So you don't have to wait 90 days. You can vaccinate when they're better. Um, that, that was my sense. I, there's, there's probably, uh, I, have, I have one personal question, not about me, but, but I want to go back to your case. And I know we're getting short on time, but so in the yeah. case presented Dr. Atmar, uh, the, the physician who had the vaccine had a, you know, a delayed response, a more biliform, uh, basically what looks to be like a drug reaction rash. And so, and so uh, on the one hand, we have that, which I think was relatively mild. And on the other hand, we have people who, you know, get headaches, the chills, and uh, maybe a little tightness in their chest. And, and we, in general, say, well, just you can get the next one. You're probably going to feel worse. Yeah. Than how it is. So I was actually surprised that you uh, said you should switch vaccines, that that, that that was categorized as enough to make one change course. And I wonder if there are other people that were missing the opportunity to do that on. I, you know, I, I, and it was mainly because it's allergic in nature, nature rather than um, just uh, reactions probably from the immune response, non-allergic immune response people have to the vaccine that uh, led not just me, but many of my fellow colleagues who have, do vaccine work um, to, we all agreed to uh, not give them the second dose. Although strictly speaking, you know, he could have gotten a, a second dose. It was just an abundance of uh, caution. Sometimes when we re-challenge patients with uh, uh, an antigen, they have a much more severe reaction. He had avoided getting COVID uh, working in the ICU for nine months. I'll take credit for that from an infection control standpoint, but <laughs> it's really, you know, He'd, he'd been able to go that long. Um, he was willing to, uh, to wait uh, an additional month or two or maybe three to, to get a different vaccine. Gary, maybe we should wrap up, I guess. Yeah. And I know there's more questions in there. And I just want to take the moment to thank Dr. Anderson, Dr. Atmar, or Dr. Wee for joining us. Uh, and always for Gary organizing these events. And Thank everybody who's vaccinating every day out there. I got some photos from Dr. Quinn in a in a in a built out shed where they were vaccinating thousands of people a day because uh, the you know one of their spaces was not available. So there's a lot of heroic work going out there by everybody. And I think at the end of the day, we need to just get vaccines in arms and get our communities vaccinated. So thank you for all the hard work. Common Spirit across you know the entire country is doing amazing work. So thank yeah. you for everything you do. Gary, any last words? No, there's there's a few more questions. I think we hit the high points, and we'll we'll send the other ones out. Uh, we'll we'll reach out to our panelists and get them. Thank you, everybody. It's great. And our speakers, both of you, Mark and Dr. Atmar, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.